All right, guys, welcome back to another online lecture. Today, we are starting with chapter 11. And chapter 11 uh, bridges off some of the knowledge that we learned in chapter 10. Uh, but chapter, or sorry, section 1 of chapter 11 will feel a little bit different. Um, in section 11.1, we are going to be learning how to approximate functions with polynomials. So to give you some motivation, let me give you this scenario. Imagine that you're stranded on a deserted island with no way of escaping. You've been stuck there for weeks, so you're getting really desperate. One day, your former calculus teacher, that's me, cruises along by in his boat. So because I'm cruel, I decide that in order to board my boat, you have to compute one of the two following calculations by hand exactly. So you cannot be off by a single decimal place. Given that you are stranded on this island, you have no technology to assist you. Um, and also, once you have chosen your problem, you cannot change your mind after you start calculating it. So it's very important that you choose the correct one from the beginning. Which of these two calculations do you pick? Do you choose calculation one, which is this thing? Or do you choose calculation two, which is this thing? I'll give you a few seconds to think about it, and then I will let you know what the correct choice is. All right, you have one in mind? Okay, so if you happen to pick the second option, then you're gonna die on that island. Uh, it is so much easier to compute using addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division than it is to compute functions like the natural log of x, square root of x, or the cosine of x. If we look again at this calculation, um, it is possible to calculate 3.1 squared. Uh, it might take a little bit of work, but we all know that if you take 3.1 times 3.1, you know, you can multiply the ones together, you can carry, and you can do all sorts of stuff, and you eventually get an answer here, right? It is possible. It is possible to do 3.1 to the 4th, 3.1 to the 6th, 3.1 to the 8th. We can even calculate 8 factorial. You know, it's just 8 times 7 times 6 times 5. It'll take some effort, right? There's a lot of multiplication to do there, a lot of subtraction afterwards and addition. Uh, but it is possible. But with cosine of 3.1, where do you start? What, what can you do? There is no obvious way to calculate cosine of 3.1. And so you're just out of luck. You're, you're just going to hopelessly attempt to calculate this forever and get nowhere. So uh, with this exercise, we start to understand some of the motivation behind section of 11.1. .1. We're going to try to approximate various functions with polynomials. So on the previous slide, the first value, if we actually calculated that um, sum of terms, will only be off by 0 0.02103 from the second value, so that was the cosine of 3.1, uh, suggesting that this function, 1 minus x squared over 2 factorial plus x to the 4th over 4 factorial minus x to the 6th over 6 factorial plus x to the 8th over 8 factorial, is actually a decent approximation for the function cosine of x. And we're going to learn why that is the case soon. But this will be the main concept here. We're going to approximate functions like cosine of x with polynomials that look like this. All right, so to begin, let's consider approximating functions with lines. So in calculus one, a common problem that you were given was to find the tangent line to the curve at a given point a. This is also called finding the linearization of the curve and was written as follows. We could write that y is equal to, let's see, how do I want to write this? y is equal to y1 plus m times x minus x1. Right, this is just the standard um, point slope form of a line, where y1 and x1 are just the point that it goes through. But since we're considering a here, we can say that x1 is equal to a. Uh, and then y1 is just f of a, right? It's just the function evaluated at a. So let's replace those. We could say that y1 is f of a. 
And then m, we should think about what the slope at that point is. m is just f prime of a, right? It is just the slope of your function at that point. So we can write it as f of a plus f prime of a times x minus a. And this line can be thought of as an approximation of your curve near the point A. And if you look over here at this picture to the right, our original function was this f of x, and our A occurs right here. And so the linear approximation of the curve near A, or at A, I should say, is this line. And because it is a first degree polynomial, we will call this thing p1 of x. So we could write that p1 of x is equal to this. And specifically, we note that the line matches the curve in value and in slope at a. If we look at the curve, f of x, the uh, value of the linearization and the slope of the linearization are the same right here. All right, so um, putting this a little bit more succinctly, let's think about what this can be written as. For our curve f of x, the y value at x equals a is just f of a. The slope at x equals a is just f prime of a. For the line p1 of x equals f of a plus f prime of a times x minus a, um, the y value at x equals a, well, all we have to do is plug in a right here. And if we do that, we would get f of a plus f prime of a times 0. So this is just f of a. And this indicates that the line will have the same function value as our curve. Similarly, if we want to find the slope at x equals a, we first must calculate the derivative of p1 of x. And the derivative of this, let me write this beneath. Oops. The derivative can be written like this p1 prime of x. So if we're taking the derivative of this function, note that f of a is just some number, right? f prime of a is just another number. You can think of it as a constant. And a, of course, is just some number. So the only variable here is this x. And so if we were to actually expand this out and take the derivative, this f of a would just go away and we would end up with just f prime of a. All right, and then if we plug in a right here in for that x, then nothing would change, right? Because there's no x within our function over here. And so this is also just f prime of a. So the line and the curve have the same y value and the same slope. OK, it's good to know. What if we want to do better, though? What if our approximation with a line isn't quite good enough? Is there a way to better approximate this curve? There is, in fact. We can approximate functions with quadratics. So suppose that we wish to generate a polynomial that matches our function's value so the zeroth derivative, its first derivative, and its second derivative at the point A. Whoops. All right. So the polynomial that satisfies all of those conditions is written as follows. f of A plus f prime of a times x minus a plus f double prime of a over 2 times x minus a quantity squared. 
All right, so you might be wondering where I pulled that out from. The textbook actually does a pretty decent explanation of where this polynomial comes from. But for the purposes of this class, I will just show you that it works. All right, so here's the idea. The quadratic approximation looks like this. Notice that it is a little bit better of an approximation for our function f of x near the point a. It actually kind of hugs the curve like around these points, right? It's a little bit better of an approximation. So here's an exercise. We're going to calculate the first and second derivatives of p2 of x. So p2 of x, let's just rewrite it here, is f of a plus f prime of a x minus a plus f double prime of a over 2 times x minus a quantity squared. All right, so p2 prime of x is just the first derivative. And so everything that's a constant goes away. This f of a was just a constant, so that disappears. And we end up with, well, here, the derivative would just be 1. And so we get 1 times f prime of a, so f prime of a. Over here, we have to use the chain rule, so we would multiply by 2 on the outside. And that would cancel out with the 2 here on the bottom. Perhaps I should use a different color when I underline things. And so if it cancels out with that 2, we are just left with f double prime of a times x minus a. And the second derivative, whenever we take the derivative of p2 prime of x, we are going to get just f double prime of a. All right. Next, we're going to plug in a into each one of these and see what happens. Use a different color. If we do that, if we plug in a in for this first function, then we would have to plug in an a right here and an a right here. There are no other x's to plug a's into. And so if we plug an a into those two spots, the second and the third terms will both go to 0. And so we are just left with f of a. If we plug in an a into the second function, this p2 prime of x, we have to plug in an a right there. And once again, that second term will cancel out. We are just left with f prime of a. And finally, if we plug in an a into the last function, well, there are no x's. And so it is just f double prime of a. And what we realize here is that for each one of these, this is our function's value, right? This is the function value at a. This is the function's slope at a. And then this is the function's second derivative at a. All right, and so that gives us evidence that this p2 of x is, in fact, our quadratic approximation because it matches the function's value, its first derivative, and its second derivative at x equals a. All right, so that's what it means to approximate a function with a quadratic. This is the function that would do that. All right, let's do some examples. First, we're asked to find the linear approximation of f of x equals the natural log of x at x equals 1. So this is a calculus 1 problem. Hopefully, you guys remember the general technique here. This 1 is our a. And so, let's start by just calculating the derivative of our function. So if f of x is equal to the natural log of x, then f prime of x is just 1 over x. All right. So then, 
let's throw in a into both of these, f of a, which is just f of 1, is the natural log of 1, and that is 0. And then let's calculate f prime of a. This is just 1 over 1, which of course is just 1. All right, so we will need those. We know that the linear approximation requires us to calculate p1 of x. So p1 of x, if you go back a few slides, you will notice that p1 of x is equal to f of a plus f prime of a times x minus a. So f of a was 0, f prime of a was 1, and x minus a, a was also 1, and so we just get x minus 1. And this is our linear approximation, and we're done. Next, let's find the quadratic approximation of that same function. So let's once again calculate the first and second derivatives. So f of x is equal to the natural log of x. f prime of x is equal to 1 over x. And f double prime of x is equal to negative 1 over x squared. All right, using this information, f of 1 is equal to 0, f prime of 1 is equal to 1, and f, prime, f double prime of 1 is equal to negative 1 over 1, which is negative 1. All right, so then we are going to calculate p2 of x. p2 of x is f of a plus f prime of a times x minus a plus f double prime of a over 2 times x minus a squared. So we're just going to plug all of this information in. f of a was 0, f prime of a was 1, a is 1, f double prime of a is negative 1 divided by 2 times x minus 1 quantity squared. And so this gives us the polynomial x minus 1 minus 1 half x minus 1 quantity squared. Uh, we could expand this out and get something that looks a little bit more like x squared plus uh, sum x plus, or ax squared plus bx plus c, uh, but we don't have to. This is sufficient. And this is our quadratic approximation. So if you actually graphed both of these functions, quadratic, be a quadratic approximation, and the linear approximation and compare those to the natural log of x, um, they would be equal to uh, the natural log of x at x equals 1, and they would sort of approximate the function near x equals 1. But they're not perfect, uh, and in fact, you can kind of see that over here on this picture. So this black curve is the natural log of x. The pink curve is the, um, is the linear approximation, which is a poor approximation for the function. Uh, and then this blue curve is the quadratic approximation. It is a slightly better approximation for our natural log of x. Notice that the farther you get away from 1, the worse your approximation gets. So if you were looking at just like 1.5, um, both approximations are still pretty good, but then as you get over here to even 2.5, they start to get terrible. The distance between the blue function and the black function is pretty large, 
and similarly between the black function and the pink function it is also large. So the closer you are to A, the better your approximation will be. So we're going to use both of these approximations to estimate the natural log of 1.5. Since 1.5 is close to 1, we should expect a pretty good approximation. I'll write that down, 1.5, whoops, don't mean to put a second decimal in there. 1.05 is close. To 1, so our approximation should be okay. Okay, so let's do that. P1 of 1.05 is what we are trying to calculate here. This is what happens when we plug 1.5 into our linear approximation. So this will be 1.05 minus 1, right? Because our linear approximation, remember, is just x minus 1. And that is just 0.05. And so... Uh, that's, that's not bad. And then P2 of 1.05 is equal to 1.05 minus 1 minus 1 half times 1.05 minus 1 quantity squared. And if we actually throw this into a calculator, we will get 0 0.048 seven, five. All right, so the natural log of 1.05, just conceptually, we know is just barely, barely larger than zero because the natural log of one is zero. So the natural log of a number barely larger than one is just barely larger than zero. And so this 0 0.05, is a decent approximation. Approximation. But this 0 0.4875 is a great approximation. And if we actually throw the natural log of 1.05 into a calculator, we are going to get approximately 0 0.04879. And you'll notice that these two numbers are really pretty close. And so that gives us some evidence that we did pretty well. All right, so that's how you use these linear and quadratic approximations to estimate numbers like the natural log of 1.05. All right, so now let's formally define what a Taylor polynomial is. So far, our approximations for f of x can be improved if we construct higher order polynomials that match f of x at its y value, its first derivative, second derivative. That's what we've done so far. But if we continue to build a polynomial that matches f of x at its third derivative and all the way up to its nth derivative at x equals a, we will get an even better approximation for our function, at least near the point a. So the idea is that p1 of x matches f of x at its first derivative at a, right? That's what p1 of x did. p2 of x matches at its first and second derivatives. At a. p3 of x, as you might guess, 
will match at its first, second, and third derivatives. at a. And of course all of these also match f of x at its value as well. So I'm not writing that, but um, p1, p2, and p3 all match f of x at its value. So that means that p1 of a equals f of a, p2 of a equals f of a, p3 of a equals f of a. They all match at value. And then if we continue doing this, p n of x will match f of x up to its nth derivative at a and at its value. All right. And the polynomial that matches f of x at its y value and the first n derivatives at x equals a is, so if we wanted to write it out, it'll be f of a plus f prime of a times x minus a plus f double prime of a over 2 factorial. Earlier we wrote 2, but we can write 2 factorial, times x minus a squared, plus f3 derivatives a, to guess at what I read in the denominator here, 3 factorial times x minus a cubed plus all the way up to the nth derivative of the function at a over n factorial times x minus a to the nth power. All right, let me make that a little cleaner. Okay, that probably is a little more legible. So one thing to note here is that this fn of a does not mean the nth power of f at a. It means the nth derivative. Nth derivative of our function f evaluated at a. All right, so this is the Taylor polynomial. This nth degree polynomial is called the Taylor polynomial, and it is named after Brooke Taylor, an 18th century mathematician. So what I claim is that this polynomial will match the function at its first derivative, second derivative, third derivative, all the way up to its nth derivative at the point a. So more formally, here's the textbook's definition. Um, we are going to call the number a the center. And we denote the Taylor polynomial as pn. It has the property that it matches f in value, slope, and all derivatives up to the nth derivative at a. So um, the full expression looks like this. If we wanted to write this more compactly, we could write this with summation notation where we say this is the sum from k equals 0 to n, not infinity, of ck times x minus a to the kth power, where ck is this thing, fka divided by k factorial. All right, so that's a more compact way of writing that. All right, so let's try to find some examples. We're going to find up to the eighth degree Taylor polynomial centered at a equals zero for the function cosine of x. So in order to do that, we're going to need to calculate a lot of derivatives. So let's start by doing that. So we start with f prime of x. 
Um, well, the derivative of cosine of x is negative sine of x. The second derivative is going to be negative cosine of x. The third derivative is going to be positive sine of x. The fourth derivative is equal to cosine of x. And we need to go all the way up to 8, so let's keep going. Uh, so rather than writing f with five apostrophes, I'm going to start using this notation when it gets too cumbersome. f5 of x, that means the fifth derivative of x of f, is equal to negative sine of x, f6 of x, is equal to negative cosine of x, and you're going to notice this pattern. It starts to repeat. And f8 of x is equal to cosine of x. So next what we're going to do is we're going to plug in 0 in for all of these. Yeah, we're going to plug in our a, which is 0. So plug in x equals 0. And the reason we do that is because we're going to need it, right? If we wanted to calculate the 8th degree Taylor polynomial, we're going to need the 8th derivative, and we're going to need to plug in a. So we have f prime of 0. All right, so what is negative sine of 0? Well, that is just 0. f double prime of 0, that's negative cosine of 0, so that's negative 1. f triple prime of 0, well, that's just 0. f fourth uh, uh, derivative at 0 is just 1. And similarly for the fifth, sixth, and se fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth derivatives as well. Zero, zero. The sixth derivative evaluated at zero is negative one. The seventh derivative evaluated at zero is zero. And the eighth derivative evaluated at zero is positive one. All right, great. Next, Let's use this information to actually plug into our Taylor polynomial. So we need to calculate p1 of x, p2 of x, p3 of x, p4 of x, all the way up to p8 of x. So remember that a is equal to 0. So p1 of x is equal to f of a plus f prime of a times x minus a. So that is just, use a different color. Well, f of a, we didn't actually calculate this on the previous slide. Let's do that here. f of 0 is just 1. And so we have 1 plus f prime of a times uh, x minus 0. f prime of a is just 0. And so we get 1 plus 0, so just 1. All right, next, let's calculate p2 of x. We have um, f of a plus f prime of a, or f yeah, single derivative, sorry. f prime of a times x minus a plus f double prime of a over 2 factorial times x minus a squared. All right, if we throw this in there, f of a, once again, is just 1. This term 
again, it's just zero. Um, f double prime of a, if we go back to the last slide, that was negative one. So we can say that this is minus one half times x minus zero squared. So that is p2 of x. Let's calculate p3 of x. Well, one thing you might start to notice here is that it's really just the previous Taylor polynomial plus another term. So we can write this as p2 of x plus the third degree term, which in this case is f3 of a over 3 factorial times x minus 0 quantity cubed. And if we calculate that, then p2 of x was just 1 minus 1 half x squared. Uh, but f triple prime of a is just 0. So since this thing is 0, we don't actually change our third degree Taylor polynomial. So it is the same. It is 1 minus 1 half x squared. Let's calculate the fourth degree one. I promise there's a purpose to being so meticulous, so we will appreciate having gone through this exercise. So once again, it's the third degree Taylor polynomial plus the fourth degree term. So if we calculate this, it'll once again be 1 minus 1 half x squared plus the fourth degree term. If we go back, this was 1. So we get 1 over 4 factorial. So 4 factorial is 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. So that is 24. So we can write that as 24 times x to the fourth power. So this is p4 of x. All right, let's keep going p5 of x is p4 of x plus the fifth degree term. And as you might have guessed, the fifth degree power or the fifth derivative of our function evaluated today was just zero, and so this whole thing is one minus one half x squared plus one twenty fourth x to the fourth. It didn't change. Hmm. I wonder if we're starting to see a pattern here. Let's calculate the sixth derivative, or not the sixth derivative, the sixth Taylor polynomial. P six of x is equal to p five of x plus f6 evaluated at a over 6 factorial times x to the 6th. This is going to be, probably going to run out of space here, 1 minus 1 half x squared plus 1 24th x to the 4th. This 6th degree term this was a negative one, so we have minus one over six factorial, I don't want to calculate that, times x to the sixth. All right, so all of the odd degree Taylor polynomials, the, or sorry, the three, the five, what you'll notice is that they are the same as the previous one. So p7 of x, in this case, 
will just be equal to p6 of x, right? So we get 1 minus 1 over 2 factorial x squared plus 1 over 4 factorial x to the fourth. I'm going back to writing these as factorials just to make it a little bit nicer. Minus 1 over 6 factorial x to the sixth And finally, P8, it'll have a new term. But hopefully by now you've started to see what this pattern is. This will be 1 minus 1 over 2 factorial times x squared plus 1 over 4 factorial times x to the fourth minus 1 over 6 factorial x to the sixth plus 1 over 8 factorial x to the eighth. And this function here, 1 minus 1 over 2 factorial x squared plus 1 over 4 factorial x to the fourth minus 1 over 6 factorial x to the sixth plus 1 over 8 factorial x to the eighth is exactly the function that we started with at the beginning of this lecture, where we were trying to figure out um, what was the easier calculation, that uh, 1 minus 1 over 2 factorial times 3.1 squared plus 1 over 4 factorial, uh, 3.1 to the fourth, all that junk. That was the exact same polynomial uh, that we were looking at. And so this is the reason why um, that original value uh, is a pretty close approximation to cosine of x. Uh, it's because we have calculated all of these Taylor polynomials to uh, justify that it is a decent approximation. In fact, the more of these you do, the higher um, degree Taylor polynomial that you come up with, the closer your approximation will be. And to blow your mind even a little bit more, let me show you some pictorial evidence. This little gif over here on the right uh, shows what happens when we get higher and higher degrees of Taylor polynomials. So what you'll notice is that this red function is cosine of x. It is the function cosine of x. The blue functions are the Taylor approximations. They are the Taylor polynomials. And as we get more and more degrees within our Taylor polynomial, um, it better and better approximates our entire curve cosine of x, even though we only had this zero as a center, right? We only are caring that the uh, Taylor polynomial matches its value at zero, it matches its first derivative, it matches its second derivative, third derivative, fourth derivative, fifth derivative, sixth derivative, seventh derivative, eighth derivative. We only care what happens at zero, but it just so happens that this Taylor polynomial, as you get more and more um, terms in it, will better approximate the entire function of cosine of x, which is pretty good, pretty cool. Um, and so um, what you might guess, and this is where we're going in future sections, is that if we use infinitely many terms within our Taylor polynomial, so rather than stopping here at 8, if we were to do this infinitely and have infinitely many terms, this would be exactly, exactly the function cosine of x. And that's pretty cool. Another way to write cosine of x as an infinite sum of polynomial terms. All right, and so this is kind of the concept here. We are starting with a function, and we are approximating it with Taylor polynomials. And these Taylor polynomials are a hell of a lot easier to use in calculations than the original functions themselves. All right, let's keep going. Let's now do this one for e to the x. All right, so this has a little bit easier calculation. I'll stick with blue. 
Um, here, we need to calculate the first, second, and third derivatives of e to the x. So f of x is, of course, just e to the x. Fortunately for us, f prime of x is also e to the x. f double prime is also e to the x. And you can do this infinitely many times. It will always be e to the x. So now we have to plug in 0 for all of these. I don't know if you guys can hear that, but there's an alarm going off right outside. It's very annoying. Let me actually pause here. All right, so we're back. Uh, we need to calculate f of 0. And so if we throw in 0 here, we would get e to the 0. That's a 1. Uh, if we want to calculate f prime of 0, that, of course, is just e to the 0, which is also 1. And... If we do this for each derivative, we would always get 1. Great. So now, let's calculate p1, p2, and p3 of x. So, oops, that's not what I wanted to write. p1 of x is just f of 0 plus f prime of 0 times x minus 0. <coughs> so f of 0 was 1. f prime of 0 is 1. And so we just get 1 plus x. p2 of x is just p1 of x plus the second degree term. And so the second degree term is f double prime of 0 over 2 factorial times x minus 0 squared. And so we get 1 plus x plus uh, 1 half x squared. And p3 of x is just p2 of x plus the third degree term. which is 1 plus x plus 1 half x squared. And the third degree term is just 1 over 6, that's what 3 factorial is, uh, times x cubed. All right, so these are our Taylor polynomials. All right. And you can actually see a picture of them over here on the right. You'll notice that the original um, Taylor polynomial uh, is P1. That's this guy. It is a function that matches our curve in value and in slope. And it's a decent approximation, but P2 of x is even better. And P3 of x is even better than all of those. And it gets even incredibly close to the function E of x as you get larger and lar larger powers of, or larger and larger Taylor polynomials. Uh, here you'll notice that they actually have p0 of x. That is technically defined to be just f of 0. So I'll write that over here, just so that way we have it somewhere. p0 is equal to f of 0. Um, let me write it like this p0 of x is equal to f of a in general. All right. And example c, we're going to use the Taylor polynomials of 0, 1, and 2 to estimate the square root of 18. So the hint is that we're going to need to figure out what function we're approximating, and we're going to pick a value of a where a is a close to 18, and f of a, f prime of a, and f double prime of a are all easy to evaluate. All right, so the function that we need to approximate is going to be the square root of x. So f of x is equal to the square root of x. And um, 
This choice of function isn't necessarily unique. Uh, sometimes it might be prudent to choose something like f of x equals square root of x plus 2, where that x plus 2 is all under the square root, um, or something like that. Uh, but it need not necessarily be the case. You know, whatever's fine. There, there's more than one choice. f prime of x, then, is 1 over 2 root x. And f double prime of x is equal to, um, so this thing here is really 1 half times x to the negative 1 half. So if we take the derivative of that, we would get negative 1 fourth times x to the negative 3 over 2, which is equal to negative 1 over 4x to the 3 halves. All right, so then we need to calculate f of a, f prime of a, and f double prime of a. The thing is, we need to pick a value of a where a is close to 18, and all of these calculations are easy to evaluate. So a should be chosen to be 16, because 16 is close to 18, and 16 is uh, a perfect square, and so the square root of 16 is an easy calculation. So the f prime of 16, we would get 1 half times 1 over 16, which is just 1 eighth, and then f double prime of 16 is equal to negative 1 over 4 times 16 to the 3 halves power. And 16 to the 3 halves power, you can just think of that as the square root of 16 cubed. So let me write it like that. Think of this as the square root of 16 cubed. So that is just negative 1 over 4 times 4 cubed. So uh, 4 cubed is just 64, and 4 times that is 256. So we have negative 1 over 256. All right, so... This time, we are asked to use Taylor polynomials of order 0, 1, and 2. So as we just talked about on the last slide, p0 of x is equal to just f of a. And in this case, f of a is just 4. p1 of x is equal to f of a plus f prime of a times x minus a. And so we would get 4 plus first derivative evaluated a is 1 eighth times x minus 16. p2 of x is equal to p1 of x plus the second degree term, f double prime of a divided by 2 factorial times x minus a quantity squared. And so f, prime, f double prime of a is negative 1 over 256 divided by 2 factorial times x minus a uh, quantity squared, where a in this case is 16. Um, and so I forgot the original terms here, so let me write those down. So p1 of x was 4 plus 1 8 x minus 16, 
and then the second degree term is negative 1 over 256 divided by 2 factorial times x minus 16 squared. And if we simplify this a little bit, it's going to look like 4 plus 1 eighth times x minus 16 minus 1 over 512 times x minus 16 squared. So these are what we should be writing. All right, so then um, if we are trying to estimate the square root of 18, what we are going to do is we are going to plug in 18 into these three calculations, right? Because if our function, uh, let me use the graph from the previous slide, uh, if our function is being approximated by these Taylor polynomials, then in order to estimate a value at 18, all we would have to do is plug in 18 into those different Taylor polynomials to see how good they do. All right, so let's do that on this slide. P0 of 18 is just 4, right? It was just a constant, so that didn't change. P1 of 18 is equal to 4 plus 1 eighth times 18 minus 16. And if you calculate this out, this is going to be 4.25. And P2 of 18 is equal to 4 plus 1 eighth times 18 minus 16 minus 1 over 512 times 18 minus 16 quantity squared. And if you throw this into a calculator, you're approximately going to get the number 4.242188. That number, I think, continues. Um, but uh, yeah, and so here's the idea. For different values of n, 0, 1, 2, the approximation that we get for each of those are these values, 4, 4.25, 4 4.2, 4.2, 1, um, And the error from the number square root of 18 to our polynomial approximation is this, 2.4 times 10 to the negative first, 7.4 times 10 to the negative third, 4.5 times 10 to the negative fourth. And it even gets smaller if we were to do another approximation. So do these approximations get better as n increases? The answer is, of course, yes. Because these errors from the true answer of square root of 18, if you were to throw that into a calculator and calculate the error, you would get um, errors that are increasingly small. And so um, that indicates that we are doing pretty well whenever we get larger and larger po uh, Taylor polynomials to consider. All right. Um, and I think that is where I want to stop for this lecture. We will continue with part two of this section in the next one.